Welcome to the Customer Wins Podcast, where business leaders discuss their secrets and techniques for helping their customers succeed and in turn, grow their business. Hi, I'm Rich Walker, host of the Customer Wins, where I talk to business leaders about how they help their customers win and how their focus on customer experience leads to growth. Some of our past guests have included Derek Notman of Coupler, Adam Holt of AssetMap, Philip Hecker of Bento Engine, and Louis Retief of Hubley. Today, I'm speaking with Joe Moss, co-founder of Pro Advisor Suite and curator of the Connector community. And today's episode is brought to you by Quick, the leader in enterprise forms processing. When your business relies upon processing forms, don't waste your team's valuable time reviewing the forms. Instead, get Quick. Using our Form Extract API, simply submit your completed forms and get back clean, context-rich data that is 99.9% .9 accurate. Visit quickforms.com to get started. And now to meet our guest. Joe Moss is the co-founder of Pro Advisor Suite and the curator of Connector Community. You can easily find Joe posting on LinkedIn, scheduling tech demos, talking with advisors about their tech stack, and promoting community and innovation in the advisor tech space. With Joe's passion for problem solving and helping others understand the value and optimizing their tech solution, he's developed a broad knowledge of our industry. Today, Joe helps advisors navigate the increasingly complex advisor tech landscape. Joe is a West Virginia native, now living in Lexington, Kentucky with his wife, Amanda, and their three children. Joe and his family are also active in their local church, the Trinity Christian Fellowship. Joe, welcome to the Customer Wins. Thanks for having me, Rich. I'm excited for this conversation. Me too. Now, if you haven't heard this podcast before, I talk with business leaders about what they're doing to help their customers win, how they built and deliver a great customer experience, and the challenges to growing their own company. Joe, we all want to understand your business a little better. How does your company help people? Okay, so I've been thinking about this question, and I think a lot of time on LinkedIn, people get a little bit existential, like they, they're helping, they're serving, they're giving. But in reality, we're all in this to make money. I mean, we we work so that we can make money, so that we can pay our mortgage, pay our rent, pay our you know grocery bills. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I help two sets of people. I help advisors make more money, um, and then I help the software companies that serve advisors make more money. So I'm I'm going to go real base level there. <laughs> No, I love it. I, I mean, you're right. Business is at the fundamental. It's about finance. It's about how do you have revenue? How do you grow? Right. Um, but ultimately, you're doing something. You're doing something for these two communities to bring them together so they can make money together. What do you think is the catalyst that brings them together? Yeah, so I would say I connect the two. I mean, I think from the advisor perspective, I do tech stack consulting. Um you know, the tech stack for a financial advisor can be long and complicated and, you know, overlapping tools. And I think it's helpful just to have a second opinion, look at your tech stack, someone that's looked at, you know, maybe a hundred other tech stacks um, and get advice on that and then get introduced to new tools. Um, so from that, from the advisor side, and then from the advisor tech side, you know, I help bring awareness to the service that they're offering um, and get it in front of more advisors. So hopefully, and I don't want to sell something to an advisor that's not a good fit or doesn't fit their clientele. Um, so sometimes, you know, they'll even come to me and be like, you know, I'm looking at this tool, which may be one that I represent, but I'm like, well, that's not the best fit for you. So, you know, helping them win for sure. And then also helping my uh, advisor tech clients win. You know, Joe, I love that mindset. And I, and I do the same for my customers. In fact, I'll be just blunt with them and say, I'm not interested in making a sale. I'm interested in providing a solution and helping you solve a problem. And if we're not it, we'll be the first to tell you we're not it. And I and I think that kind of honesty builds trust and rapport and is probably why you're such a great connector in the community. So let's talk about Pro Advisor Suite. What is it? Yeah, so Pride Pro Advisor Suite, I think what resonates the best is it's like the Costco of advisor tech. Um so, you know, you become a member and then you've got access to all these great deals. Um, so the deals would be on specific advisor tech programs. Um, so that's that's the core of it. And then on top of that, you know, we've got demos, we've got uh, joint demos with multiple companies. Um, so it's kind of an educational platform, also bringing out like new tools. So, you know, if there's a tool that's coming to market, um, it's kind of like advanced 
look at new tools coming out. So that's that's another aspect to it. Okay, so these tools, who do they appeal to most? Broker dealers, RIAs, independent advisors, staff people? So that's an interesting question because I mean, any financial advisor in general, um, but specifically the ones that have control of their tech stack. Um, a lot of broker dealer hybrid situations don't necessarily control what tech they purchase. So a lot of times I end up working with completely independent firms because, you know, they can pick their entire tech stack top to bottom. Okay. So that, that could be broker dealers who allow that flexibility, but definitely RIAs then, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay. So look, I have a kind of a tough question. If an advisor has already got a, a CRM and they come to pro advisor suite, they're not going to get a discount on the purchase they've already made. Right. I mean, you're, the discount they're going to get is on new products, right? Or is there something? So, yeah, it's a great question. One that, you know, when we went to market, it was an interesting sell at, at times. So we do want the tech companies to give discounts on current clients. We don't expect them to give a refund. Like if they've paid a year in advance or something, we don't expect them to give a 10% discount on money that's already been paid. But going forward, like when they renew, we are expecting a 10% discount to to go into effect because they're a member of the community. Nice. So there is that benefit then that your current tech stack could benefit you by being part of this community. For sure. Yeah. Now, is there more to it than that? I mean, is it a community where people can converse and ask questions and get help with each other? Yeah. So another part that I feel like is really cool is that we've got like tech founders, people that work at tech companies talking to the actual users, the advisors, the ops managers of the software. Um, and, you know, working things out or, or scheduling time offline. Um, and I feel like that is happening in communities. It's not even necessarily happening in, on like LinkedIn, like people are just more open to be like, Hey, I need this in this software. Can you make this happen? And, you know, they can actually like discuss it, which I think is pretty cool. Um, we also have companies like coming into the community to find out what advisors are talking about. Um, so, you know, they can search a certain phrase or a certain company uh, and bring up all the past posts, videos, et cetera, that about that topic. Okay. Now, look, I, I'm part of your community. I, I, I'm on the school.com uh, platform for these right. communities you're doing. And, and I think it's a really interesting platform, but from your perspective, Tell people why it's different than LinkedIn. Why why can't LinkedIn do what you're doing? Um, I I guess it's like a walled garden in a way. I mean, LinkedIn is for anybody and everybody. Um, mm -hmm. and I think within school, it's like a specific group of people. So that's that's a, that's an interesting question. I almost got to think about that a little bit. You know, um, I also think. I mean, just to add to this, my own perspective is that you have this continuity of discussion in your environment that you don't get with LinkedIn. Like if you put right. a post on LinkedIn, you can see comments and stuff, but it's hard to find that post three months from now. Whereas I think in your community, it's so much easier to see it. And there's also the membership aspect where you can engage with people more directly. Whereas LinkedIn does put up some barriers to that if you're not connected to them, right? Yeah, I, so I guess the communities have a specific purpose. Um, a specific topic, a specific purpose, and then you know you can have different communities with a with a slightly different purpose. Um, so, like you know, my the community I started out with RA operators. When I started the Pro Advisor Suite community, people were like, "Well, wait a minute, what's the difference between these two two communities?" And it's like, "Well, this one is like all operations, you know, maybe with a focus on CRM specifically, and this one is like strictly tech, like advisor tech stuff." Yeah. Um, not necessarily operations related things. So yeah, it, it helps to have like a specific purpose for, for a specific person too. Like yeah. you don't want a bunch of doctors and attorneys coming into the advisor tech community because it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> They're not going to ask the same questions. That's that's so true. Um, right. So you, you've really piqued my interest because you posted an article about the, the rise of communities as a business model. So I'm curious how you see the community business model. What does it mean? And should others be doing it? Yeah, so Alex Hermosi, some people may know him, some may not. He's a fairly famous like business coach type person in, in the 
entrepreneur space, I guess. Um, he just made a significant investment in school and he had a quote, something like school makes um, like it's the easiest way to start a business ever using school. Basically, he's like, I've been looking for years on the easiest way to start a business and now school has provided it. So I think that's, um, and it's, it is around like a topic. So you create a community around a specific topic, you know, you start to build a free membership. And at some point, once there's significant value, significant conversations, you can make your community paid. Um, and all the payments and stuff is handled by school. And, you know, you can just, um, you know, increase your price as the value goes up and make a decent amount of income from a paid community. And school, it's S-K-O-O-L dot com, right? Yeah. So that that's a platform for communities if you wanted to build a community. Um, I, and I've seen others like Circle. I'm not, I actually have a membership on Circle for a different type of community. But I really like what school is doing to make it easy for somebody to say, I'm going to start a community. Okay, but it's one thing to sign up and start doing it. What are the activities? How how do you become successful with this? How do you attract people into your community and build it? So yeah, I mean, it's, you've got to have interesting content. Um, I think this is kind of marketing in general, but in order for people to come to your community, you've got to have something going on that they want to see or be a part of. So, you know, I typically start my communities with a series of giveaways. Um, so like I'll give away books or something related to the topic of the community. And they have this leaderboard system built in. So basically it's like the top 10 people that are posting the most, interacting the most will show up on the leaderboard. And then I give um, the giveaway to those people like on a monthly basis. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is people will have like a webinar, but they'll only let people that join the community attend the webinar. So basically mm -hmm. it's um, it's kind of like a lead magnet in, in okay. website terms. Um, but basically like, hey, come to this webinar and you get to the webinar by joining the community. That makes sense. Do you think financial advisors should have a, their own community? I mean, that that's going to be hard from a regulatory standpoint, but I'm just wondering what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it may seem a bit exaggerated, but I feel like almost every online business should have a community, um, just a place for your prospects or for your niche to to hang out, to learn more about what you do kind of thing. Yeah. We, we were thinking about doing that here at Quick. And, you know, we have a very interesting niche in the forms space. So right. we were thinking about bringing people together who care about forms. I mean, really nobody grew up saying, I want to grow up and do forms for a living, but there are people who do, and we're one of them. So we're sure. thinking about doing a community like that. Um, but it's, it seems a little daunting at the same time. Like, do you, how much time do you put in to manage and curate content and manage the people and the memberships? Is that a full-time thing or is that just oh, a couple hours a week? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Well, I'm part of a couple communities now, so I'm running a couple. Um, I mean, it's like LinkedIn, like you could spend eight hours a day on LinkedIn or you could sure. spend 30 minutes a day. So I think it could become a lot, but I think it's part of a, an overall marketing strategy. Um, and it's exactly like LinkedIn. Like if you want to get engagement, you post regularly, like, like daily, and also, you know, you've got to comment and like and share and do all the um, interaction type stuff that you would do on a platform like LinkedIn. Yeah. So what's Connector Community? That's your other one, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so Connector is a platform that Derek Notman started. I, I wouldn't say platform, actually. It's a course that Derek Notman started to help advisors uh, transition their businesses from like in-person to virtual. Um, and he kind of was like the leader in the space because he would travel around the world and, you know, take exotic pictures of him working on his laptop on a train on the beach. Um, and he launched Connector like right before COVID. I believe he launched at the end of 2019. So I think that it was a really good transition for advisors going into um, COVID to realize that there was an opportunity to work virtually Um and his his course has just really in depth training all the way from like setting up your desk to the software you use to the virtual sales process to how to run a webinar to you know writing an ebook like really in depth basically everything he thought someone would need to know to become like a virtual advisor. Okay, 
And so now you're managing that and and people are still going through that transition, right? They're still trying to figure that out. Yeah, for sure. No, and it's um so it's interesting when you take over someone's product or community, at some point you have to figure out, you know, what was his mission? Um, and then what's my mission with this community? So I think that that foundation of like running a virtual business is a really strong foundation. And then I think beyond that, kind of my mission of just like helping people grow. Um, yeah. One of my mottos kind of across all my businesses is like up and to the right, um, just like with the, with the increasing graph. So yeah, I think that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping with connector as well. Plus I love the word connector, you know, the misspelled connector. Um, Cause I feel like on LinkedIn, that's my goal is to be kind of a connector. Well, you are, you definitely are. I, and one of the things I admire about you is that when you engage with people, it's not just a high, you go in and ask specific questions. Like you've asked me really good questions just in a comment on LinkedIn. And I started thinking about like, wow, that must be one of the most powerful ways to engage people and to get see people to see you because now you started a dialogue, not just, Hey, nice post, but you said, what was it that made you think that or et cetera? How sure. did you develop that skill? I mean, that is, is that a natural thing you do or did you learn that somewhere? Hmm. That's a, that's a good question. So it is interesting because I've been involved in online communities, like even way before this. Um, it's so like a, a while ago, I was like a Dave Ramsey uh, coach. Um, I took his like financial coaching program was in the Dave Ramsey coaching community. Um, and and I would write stuff that just got incredible engagement because I just, I guess I saw holes in the, in the whole system. Um, when something is pitched a certain way and you realize on the back end that it's like not actually true or, or it's just when you tell the truth, people like really jump on the bat, the bandwagon. So I guess identifying issues, um, Kate Gee and my, my, former boss at Complicity Ops is like, you just have a really good way of simplifying complex things. Um, so maybe it's some of that. Uh, that may be a gift. I, it reminds me of uh, improv comedy. The highest form of truth is actually what's funny on stage. Sure. And I think asking people direct questions and getting them to talk about things behind it is way more engaging. Um, you know, I, I, there, there's a question I like to ask, which is about, artificial intelligence, but it's making me think about the types of tools that are out there. There's a tool now that I forget which one it is. You can have a plugin in your Chrome browser and it will write your comments and posts for you, especially comments on people's posts on LinkedIn. Have you played with any of those tools? I I think I know which one you're talking about. I also don't know the name. Um, I did play with it. I wasn't impressed with the, and I think that's where AI breaks down, honestly. It's like, when you're writing a LinkedIn post, that's going to be very engaging. AI just can't write that. Like, because AI is not creative. I guess, I guess that's what I would say. AI is very like boring, like cut yeah. and dry, like, because it can only pull from, um, you know, other content basically where when you're writing really good LinkedIn content, like it's gotta be very personal, very creative, very engaging. Um, so I haven't found AI to be great at writing that kind of content. So I've just started this last week, actually. Um, I've had a year of recording podcasts. So I have over 52 episodes recorded at this point. And I decided to put all the transcripts into a GPT model. Yeah. And one of the outcomes of that GPT model is it's heard me talk so many times. I can ask it to, to write things in my voice. Yeah. And it does a pretty good job, frankly. I, I would cool. still edit it. I wouldn't just post it, you know, straight across, but I'm like, hey, it sounds like me. It's kind of cool. <laughs> that is but what, one of those things that those tools are like adding a comment. I think the comments can be really blustery or superfluous or flowery. And that's not your voice, right? When when you write and again, I admire this about you. You ask an engaging question by being direct. And going straight to the point of like, okay, so you said you failed. How did you fail? I forgot exactly what question you asked me. Um, it was something like that of what to do or not to do. I can't remember. But anyway, I, I think that's probably one of the reasons you are successful in building communities because you have figured out how to engage people. When you have a community running like Pro Advisor Suite, what's the tipping point when the community starts to take over 
performing the engagement, like hosting naturally without you? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, so when you start a community, I mean, I'll look back through and it's like, if I'm the only one posting, then that's an issue. Um, but if you look at like RA operators, which is much more, uh, it's it's been around a lot longer. Um, you know, you'll see like, I'm posting every seven posts or something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is, I think you have to get people comfortable to post um, and they have to know, I guess, every community has like its rules of engagement or something. Um, and they have to know what the rules of engagement are. And I think that you can teach people what they are by like asking them to do things. So every time I start a community, I usually have like a start here post that has some instructions on like introduce yourself and then go check out this or something. Um, and you can pin those to the top. Like in another community, I have like a map. So you you look at the map and then you put in your location and then I'll add it to the map. And so everyone can see where everyone else lives basically. Um, but just activities like that, where you ask them to do a specific action and then they get used to like doing things. Yeah. Um, have you had any bad actors you had to kick out? I don't actually think I have yet. Oh, good for you. That's great. That yeah. means you're bringing high quality people to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, going back to the business model, I, I have admired this business model for quite some time, never figured out how to do it. I mean, I have a software company, so um, I haven't really said I'm going to set my focus on building a community per se, but sure. one community that comes to mind that is outside the realm here is Lease Hacker. You ever heard of Lease Hacker? I have not. So the the E in Hacker is taken off. So it's leasehackr.com. It's an online forum for how to hack a car lease. <laughs> and it's fascinating. I I see that as a really successful one. The guy started by having a post like once every month or two, just kind of a blog article and then building a forum sure. and then growing from there. So now he's got a paid version that you can be part of that gives you more depth, more in, in depth knowledge, et cetera. But I think this speaks to the model you're after, which is you build up a, a community of people of a similar interest, you draw them together, and then you see where it kind of flows and where it turns into something. So going back to then, um, you were, I met you through RA operators and around the time we met is when you were putting pro advisor suite together, getting ready to launch it. What gave you the idea for pro advisor suite? Yeah. So just one comment on your, uh, lease hackers, I guess, um, for a long, a long time, people were talking about niches or I'll call them niches because it rhymes with riches. Um, <laughs> uh, and like Michael and Alan Moore have been huge proponents of the niche for advisors. And, you know, they've got the the survey with, you know, if you have a niche, you know, you won't do quite as well year one and year two, but then year three and year four, you'll like go way past the people that, that don't have a niche. Mm -hmm. um, so I think niche in general across, I mean, across most every industry is now a pretty adopted concept. Um, and I think that there's going to be sub niches and then like sub sub niches um, and so I think like financial planners in the future will be creating an entire business around like a sub sub niche, <laughs> um, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, yeah, so pro, pro advisor suite, I actually didn't have the idea. I'm going to be honest. Um, someone came to me, so I saw with, uh, Prezolts and, uh, Optivice, he actually came to me with the idea. He has two advisor tech companies. Um, and we were just chatting on LinkedIn message and he was like, what do you think about this idea? And so like, we refined it a bit. Then we had a call about it. Um, and then, you know, my position at Simplicity Alps was actually phasing out a little bit. So I was like, all right, I'll start working on this. Um, so that's, that's the origination of the idea. It, it made me think back to, I think mid 2000s, 2006, seven to my silver bullet. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I actually did a post about that. Yeah. Okay. How, how do you think it compares? I mean, it's new tech, it's better tech. Um, I mean, honestly, it's still all about integrations. Like I, I went back and read that like original article from, I don't remember when it was like 2009 or something. Um, and it, the, the whole article was all about integrations. And there was like three or four companies that were coming together that were, yeah, like the, the tech stack in a way. Um, and now like integration is still like the number one pain point for advisors for their tech stack. And so my thought on integration is that 
integration is the people, like the people that run the tech. The CSAs and the ops managers are the integration between these softwares and training them properly um, is, is the best way to integrate your softwares. Like, sure, it helps if you like put someone's name in one software and it automatically, you know, updates in all your other softwares. Um, but you've got to have people running the technology that know exactly how all that works. Well, I want to let you in on the secret. I mean, being being a software company ourselves, it yeah. costs a lot of money to build integrations. Sure. And if we can't find a way to make money by building an integration, if we can't see that it will create more loyalty or a longer subscription or something like that, it's hard to say, yeah, I'll go build that integration. So I think just in general, that's why your answer is spot on. The people fill in the gaps when the tech companies can't or won't build the level of integration they want. Yeah, and so it's funny because like when I was going through college, I was kind of anti-college. Um, and then now <laughs> I'm on this platform called School, S-K-O-L, which is kind of like, I see it as the future of education, basically. I mean, I think this the standard four-year college degree will change significantly down the road. Um, and so my vision for RIA specifically is to have like a RIA, RIA university of like a hundred different school groups, communities, um, you know, all different topics within the RIA industry. And then almost like every single advisor tech company has like a user community. So um, that's a great idea. Because yeah, so like every advisor tech company has a user community that has like all their getting started videos. Um, you know, that's that becomes their like help desk too. So instead of having like a support system, you just have a community. Um, and then I think one step further, I'm kind of excited about this stuff. Sorry. <laughs> Go for it. We want to hear it. <laughs> one step further is like within an RAA, I feel like school is also a great platform for like internal training. Um, hmm. So like even within your business i don't know if it's best for like communication like a slack or a teams um but just like getting someone up to speed like you can record a bunch of training videos with transcripts um and it can almost be like a wiki too because it's incredibly easy to search that is a good idea actually because i don't know that we have found the best place to put training materials like i've recorded videos about our industry for to train people on what is a financial advisor what's a broker dealer right. what's a clearing firm and I think we have those, obviously we have the recordings and I think we posted them in a Slack channel called training and we send people that channel and say, go read everything in that channel, but that's not really the best approach. Right. So I think that's, I think that's smart. And Joe, to your idea of, you know, bringing in tech companies to build their user communities, I would say the challenge is to have a community in the first place. You know, we have our users, but to get them all to talk. So like my idea of, should we build our own community? It's a tough one because it's another activity we have to do. And we have to then go source the people as well as the content. So if you're allowing somebody like us to come in and build the user group within your environment where you have the people already, sure. that's really, really powerful. That that adds a lot of value to being a member of Pro Advisor Suite, for example. Smart. Yeah, idea. no, and I'm I'm hoping to build that out more. I mean, like if you'll see within the Pro Advisor Suite classroom, I have a little course on each one of our participating vendors. Um, and my initial vision was you know, to have a significant number of resources there, but, you know, it takes time and effort from their side and from my side to put each one of those together. So it hasn't quite come to fruition, but I think that, yeah, each one could have a separate community or you could just have one community with like a whole bunch of mini courses within it or mini yeah. thing type things. No, that's great, man. I'm glad we're talking about this. Okay. Let me switch back to that favorite topic of mine, artificial intelligence. Sure. How, so, I mean, given what you're doing, you're building community, you're posting a lot, you're engaging, you're creating content, you're bringing people together. What? How do you see AI impacting what you do? Yeah, so, I mean, I've played with chat GBT a lot. I have the paid version um, and I ask it questions and I use it to um, build outlines and stuff. Like it's very good at, you know, putting together an outline because that's kind of the hard part sometimes. If you're writing a blog post or, putting together a bio or whatever, just creating a, a framework to start on. Mm -hmm. um, but something that kind of has been weaving through our conversation is LinkedIn and marketing and, um, you know, engagement. And so I came across this tool called heat.ai. It's H-E-E-T dot A-I. All the best LinkedIn companies are out of Ukraine for some reason. I don't know. There's a lot mm -hmm. of LinkedIn type companies coming out of Ukraine. 
but so this company, and I wouldn't, I don't think I'd use it myself, but basically it goes on your behalf and comments on like 500 to a thousand posts per day. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> and so then I was like, okay, this is very interesting because maybe I don't necessarily want to do that. And you probably get kicked off LinkedIn anyway, but the concept is very interesting because when someone creates a post, like what they want is they want lots of people to come comment, like share their post but everyone's thinking about themselves. So mm -hmm. everyone's saying, well, I want to put out a post that people comment, like, and share on. But if nobody comments, likes, and shares, then nobody gets any engagement. Um, so when you go and comment on someone else's post, it it's almost like a, an exchange of sorts because they're like, oh, you gave me some attention, so I'm going to come see what you do. So just, and I've heard this many times now recently, but it's like commenting is almost more important than posting. Um, mm -hmm. so you can build your following on LinkedIn just by being a really great commenter. You don't have to post. So I thought that was kind of, I, I think you posted an article about that if I'm not wrong. And I read it. Yeah. And one of the points the guy was making is that it's hard to post 10 times a day, even 10 times a week, even 10 times a month, but you can comment 10 times right. a day. Yeah. That's way easier. So you're right. That that's so smart. Do you, do you think that we're going to see, I mean, you just brought up an idea that this AI could be used for, I don't know, to cheat the system in a way. I mean, Twitter had this problem with bots going and following and then unfollowing people to build up, you know, followership. Right. Do you see that? Do you see AI as going that way or is LinkedIn going to put the kibosh on that really well? No. So I'm doing all this LinkedIn follower tracking. Um, and some people, I, I hear these comments like, oh, he bought his followers. It doesn't count. And it's like, um, I know you could do that on, I forget what platform I was looking into that kind of thing, but I didn't realize people could do that on LinkedIn and maybe they can. I didn't know they could, yeah. But I do know that LinkedIn is like actively killing profiles that are not real or not not live or active. Um, so like I was talking to this one fellow and he like lost 6,000 followers, you know, in a day. And he's like, what in the world happened? And it's like LinkedIn had gone through and like cleaned his followers. Wow. Um, so I think that's interesting. And I think another thing is like, they say like a hundred people that are engaged with your contents better than 10,000 that aren't like, um, you have to keep in mind, like what's actually valuable. And I think that even though I'm running this like weekly follower tracking program, um, you got to focus on what's like just the metrics, not necessarily important. It's, it's the engagement and the, um, the real live human interaction. Yeah, I, you know, you see that with like the influencer community and the micro influencer community. People have a very small subset of followers, but those followers are very, very much tied to that person. They're highly, right. highly engaged. Uh, my brother is an artist and he read a book about creating super fans. And he said, if he's a musician and he had a thousand super fans, he'd make enough to live on for the rest of his life. All he has to do is produce something every year because 500, 500 out of those thousands will buy. You don't right. need a hundred thousand to make that happen. So I think there's a, a mind shift that people have to have, which actually speaks to something else I was thinking about, which is I don't just accept any connection request I get on LinkedIn. My basic rule is I have to meet you. I have to talk to you. I have to have a real connection. Otherwise, uh -huh. what's the point? Do you follow sure. that same mindset? If they're in my industry, I mean, if it's a financial advisor, I'm going to accept the the connection request. Um, but if I look at their profile and if they have like two followers or 15 followers, I, I'm a little, I, I just ignore those ones. Or if they're like in some completely other industry, I, I don't typically connect with those. Um, yeah, the because every, requests... every, connection, every connection is a follower. So mm -hmm. if you're trying to build your follower account, like connecting with people is a good way to to grow your follower account. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is a good fear or not. I, I just have this fear that if I connect with somebody who's not really well connected to me, that they're going to then try to prospect people I know. And they're going to be like, oh, Rich, and I know Rich. I'm connected to him. You should connect with me. And it's like, it's false. That's why I say no to all the SEO experts, all the offshore software development people, all the uh, let us do your IT, let us buy you less, all that stuff. All the salespeople, they're gone. Um, Joe, we're going to have to wrap this up here, but I have another question. And before I ask it, I want people to know how to connect with you because you're the connector. What's the best way to find Joe Moss? 
Um, I think LinkedIn is a great place. Uh, just type Joe Moss and I've got a spider web in front of my name and a graph on the back of my name. So I'm pretty easy to find. Um, and if you want to email me, it's just Joe at ProAdvisorSuite.com. Nice. Okay. So is that a technique you learned to put graphics in your name so people find you easier? It just stands out. I mean, when someone tags you, you you've got a very, uh, you know, your name sticks out more than a regular tag with like no icons in it um, or emojis. Sorry. So, and then Eric Negron on LinkedIn recently did a post and he's like calling out all the people that had an emoji in their name and asking them what they were going to do for next year. So <laughs> like last year I had books and then a, a graph that matched the color of the book. So it was like red, green, and blue books, and then a red, green, and blue graph. So this year I'm changing it to the, the web and the graph to kind of show the whole networking thing. Nice. I got to think about that because Richard Walker is such a common name. Yeah. I, I don't know if people have a hard time finding me. It's just quick CEO or quick form CEO, but right. regardless, um, man, I, I like talking to you. So here's my last question, Joe. Who has had the biggest impact impact on how you approach your role in our wealth tech and fintech world? Yeah, so I think um, I'm going to actually reference three people <laughs> just because okay. I, feel, I feel like there's a bit of a story. So Pat Flynn is the first person I came across in like the online business space. Um, he runs a, a website called Smart Passive Income. Um, and it's kind of like at the very beginning of the internet when like blogs were a thing and people were trying to make money by running ads on a blog. Um, and it's a lot of people were getting into it because they thought they could make a lot of money. And I think that, you know, you quickly realize like, I got to have a ton of people following my blog before I'm going to make money on ads. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was kind of the first person that I started reading that I was like, wow, I could actually make money online. And I also started realizing that, you know, most people trade time for money. So it's like one hour for an hourly rate or one year for a salary. Um, and you cannot grow your income very quickly trading time for money. It's just, you're very capped. Um, but when you trade value for money, which is a product, basically, when you trade value for money, you can scale it so much faster. Um, that's kind of the whole like online business. You can make money, you can scale it. It's not based on your hours. Um, and then the next one I'd say is Sam Oven. So he owned consulting.com, just has a ton of great YouTube content about you know, running a business, um, being a disciplined human being. Um, and he is actually the founder of school. So S K O L. Um, so he, he sold that consulting business and started school and his vision for school is a billion users. So like, I've been a huge proponent of school as like the next biggest social media platform. Um, and then lastly, I'd say Alex Ramosi. I mean, he's kind of a make a ton of money, have huge muscles kind of guy. But I think that his his ideas are really good. And so he actually just partnered with Sam Ovens on school. And I think that them together are just going to be amazing for online entrepreneurs um, and just help a lot of people escape the rat race in a way. So Yeah. Well, those are great references. I, I think people are really going to get a lot of value out after hearing this um, and hearing how communities work. And really your honesty about let's make money and let's help each other make money. I, I think that's pivotal. Um, so look, I want to say a huge thank you to Joe Moss, co-founder of Pro Advisor Suite for being on this episode of The Customer Wins. Go check out Joe's website at proadvisorsuite.com. And don't forget to check out quick at quickforms.com where we make processing forms easier. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion and we'll click the like button, share this with someone and subscribe to our channels for future episodes of The Customer's Win. Thanks for joining me today, Joe. Thanks for having me. It's been awesome. Thanks for listening to The Customer Wins Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.